if you were going to be baptized as an adult, as a free thinker, deciding for yourself what you want to believe, you were at odds with the state. The state could not afford it because there would be insurrection. Let's just start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, when the issue of your character comes up for discussion, the devil is very, very angry. And therefore I pray for your special guidance, your special presence, and may the angels surround us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yesterday, we spoke about pearls of truth in settings of gold. Now, I didn't choose that title haphazardly. A pearl is something that develops through pain. And you will remember that the gates of the New Jerusalem are of pearls because there was a lot of pain involved in setting up the New Jerusalem. And gold in the Bible means character. I counsel to you, of you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. And these precious truths that were discovered in the Reformation and post-Reformation period, every single one of them was contested And the people were hounded and persecuted and tortured and killed in the most horrendous ways by both Roman Catholics and Protestants. And that is something that is very hard to comprehend and to understand. But history tells us that that is exactly what happened. And when these precious Jewels had been gathered, these precious pearls. God took them to the United States of America and to North America in general, not only the United States. And that's why in the series we have that map in the background on the front there. But that was not all that God did. There were certain things that still had to be corrected because there were so many misconceptions on the character of God. And the work that the Reformation had done was not complete. It was incomplete. And so God had to raise up one organization after the other. And the Anabaptists, they were the one that started the idea of you know, adult baptism. And then the idea of the premillennial coming of Christ. And for all of these things, they were persecuted, but the idea had been planted. And all these remnants of God's suffering people had moved away out of persecution. And then God raised up the Baptist church. And there were super preachers amongst the Baptists. And you think of Spurgeon. But you remember what he was? He was a particular Baptist which means he had a Calvinistic mindset. And then that movement, when it was persecuted and harmed it, and later, to an extent, accepted in Europe, moved also to the United States and became the largest movement. But even that eventually broke up into different groups, different thinking, some thinking this way, some thinking that way. And Seventh-day Baptists started arising. So all of these ideas were in this tank. But they hadn't been gathered together because the time was not yet right to gather them together. Something else had to be set straight. And that was the issue of the character 
of God. Because God is on trial. He is on trial. And humanity has to determine whether God is just or whether God is not just. Because the devil accused God of being unjust. He said to God, you cannot be both merciful and just at the same time. The two exclude each other. And so he had planted this idea of this, this deity, this wrathful deity, that was either all mercy or all justice. And something was missing. How do we understand God? So God had to raise up another movement. And that movement, which I hadn't discussed yet, was the Methodist movement. The Methodists. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, described God's grace as prevenient grace, justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. Now, he was in the Church of England. He was an Anglican. Our Wesleyan heritage, if we have a look at their own webpage, the people of the United Methodist Church, we asked them what they stand for and what the distinctive emphasis of the Methodist Church was. Wesley and the early Methodists were particularly concerned about inviting people to experience God's grace and to grow in their knowledge and love of God through disciplined Christian living. They placed primary emphasis on Christian living, on putting faith and love into action. This emphasis on what Wesley referred to as practical divinity has continued to be a hallmark of the United Methodism today. Well, that's a very noble thing. What is prevenient grace or enabling grace? It's a Christian theological concept rooted in Arminian theology. And we have to discuss that because we have to understand how the pearls of truth were coming together. And here was a can of worms that had to be opened up for debate. And no one person was going to do this. It had to be a movement. It had to permeate into the minds of people before they could shift or have this paradigm shift in their thinking about God. It is divine grace that precedes human decision. In other words, God will start showing love to that individual at a certain point in his lifetime. Now, I'm not sure whether I agree with that. God showed love before you were even there. Prevenient grace is embraced primarily by Armenian Christians who are influenced by the theology of Jacob Arminius or John Wesley. So John Wesley adopted the Arminian concept. We'll have to discuss this. So Wesleyan Arminians believe that grace enables but does not ensure personal acceptance of the gift of salvation. Wesley typically referred to it in his 18th century language as prevenient grace. In current English, the phrase preceding grace would have a similar meaning. Okay, so what are we getting at here? He also spoke about sanctifying grace. So salvation is not a static one-time event in our lives because those people who placed super emphasis on justification said, you're justified and that's it. You believe and that's it. But Wesley said, no. There's something more. John Wesley described this dimension of God's grace as sanctification or holiness. Through God's sanctifying grace, we grow and mature in our ability to live as Jesus lived. As we pray, study the scripture, fast, worship, share in fellowship with other Christians, we deepen our knowledge of and the love for God. And as we respond with compassion to human needs and work for justice in our communities, we strengthen our capacity to love our neighbor. Our inner thoughts, motives, as well as the outer actions and behavior are aligned with God's will and testify to our union with God. Why was it necessary that this concept, that you cannot just have business as usual when you become a Christian, you have to clean up your act. Hi, 
Hi YouTube, I'm Walter Feit from Amazing Discoveries. If you'd like to learn more or you would like to subscribe, then click visit our webpage, donate, share and we would like to hear from you.